In the last video, we talked about how important it is for markets to get the price exactly right in order to extract all of the gains from trade. In this video, we're going to talk about why is it that we have good reason to expect markets to find the right price, even when no expert is planning what the price will be or should be in the market. All right. So the reason the basic reasoning uh, for why we expect the price to end up here at the intersection of supply and demand is because prices that are above that, there's going to be a built in mechanism that pushes them back down lower. And when prices fall below that intersection, again, there will be natural forces that push the price back up. So let's think about what I'll call excessively high prices first and why they are unstable. By excessively high, all I mean is they're above the intersection of supply and demand. So let's take some price that is above that intersection and draw a line through there. Just call that price P, okay? Or I'll call it PH, it's a, it's a high price. All right, now in the last lecture, we learned that if you take a price and you intersect it with the supply and demand curve, you can find out how many units do consumers want to buy and how many units do sellers want to sell. So if we take this point where the price hits the demand curve and we draw a line straight down, then we get the quantity of units demanded. Okay, But notice that at that price, the sellers want to offer a lot more units for sale. Okay, quantity supplied is way out here. Now this situation where the quantity of units that sellers want to sell is greater than the quantity, quantity of units that buyers want to purchase, that is called a surplus. Okay, a surplus of product or a surplus of goods. What would this look like? Well, imagine that you are running a business and the situation is such that you want to offer more goods than buyers want to buy. For example, let's say that you're running a supermarket and you're putting orange juice on the shelves and the price at which you are selling the orange juice is up here, okay? What does that mean? Well, the, your suppliers of orange juice, they're going to be very willing to send you shipments, okay? You're going to easily be able to stock your shelves with, uh, with orange juice. However, your customers are not very interested in buying the orange juice that you're stocking. And so you've got plenty of inventory left on the shelves. The, as the new shipments come in, they're just stacking up in the back room, taking up inventory space. And if you are a seller, it, finding yourself in that situation, you're gonna realize, oh shoot, if I want to uh, actually move my product, I'm gonna to have to cut the price, right? Because my customers aren't going to buy this product or not enough of it, this product uh, if I keep the price as high as it is, right? You would be thinking that, other sellers would be thinking that, and so competition among the sellers is gonna put downward pressure on this price, right? So I'll say, up here I'm gonna write a note that competing sellers lower their price, okay? You've got sellers really eager to sell, buyers not so eager to buy, so competition among these sellers is gonna put downward pressure on the price. Now that, by the way, brings up an important point, which is very often, when people think about competition in a market, they might think that sellers are competing with buyers in the market, but that's not true, okay? Sellers do not compete with buyers. Sellers compete with other sellers. The sellers and the buyers are not competing against each other. The sellers and the buyer are actually, they're trying to cooperate with each other, but it's a, a form of cooperation that we would call negotiation, okay? The sellers, they want the price to be as high as possible, and the buyers want the price to be as low as possible, so they are going to have to negotiate that out uh, between themselves. But 
the buyer and the sellers both want the same thing, which is for transactions to happen, okay? The sellers are competing with each other because anytime a seller makes a sale to a buyer, that means that some other seller didn't get to make that sale to a buyer, okay? So you can think about it. It's, it's a similar situation to um, you know, what, what happens in dating markets, at least in heterosexual dating markets where you have uh, men and women that want to uh, date each other, right? Take a, a given man, take a given woman. They're not competing with each other over the relationship. They are engaging in the relationship together, right? Now, there's going to be some negotiation there. They might not want exactly the same things. There's going to be some give and take. But at the end of the day, they both have the same goal, which is be in a relationship together, okay? However, if you look at other men, they are competing with that man to engage in a relationship with the, the woman. And likewise, other women are engaged in competition with this particular woman to be in a relationship with that man, okay? So just like men compete with each other for the attention of women, women and women compete with each other for the attention of men, sellers compete with other sellers for the attention of buyers. And on the next page, I will also write down, buyers compete with other buyers for the attention of sellers, right? As a buyer, your main co competition is with other people who want to buy the product instead of you. But the point here, or the main point here is, if prices are excessively high, then there's a built-in mechanism that's going to push them back down towards this intersection of supply and demand. Competition among the sellers is not going to allow a situation of surplus to, ex to persist for a long period of time, okay? All right, now let's think about what happens on the other side if prices are excessively low. Turns out that they are also unstable. So by excessively low, I just mean a price that is below this intersection of supply and demand. So take a price that is below that intersection going to call it PL. It's the low price. And just like before, we can, you know, find the intersection of the price with the supply and demand curves, find out how many units consumers want to buy, how many units uh, producers want to sell. And what you find is that the quantity demanded is going to be quite high. Where this price intersects the demand curve, we draw a straight line down. That's the quantity of units demanded. Sellers, however, are not going to be so eager to sell at this low price. The buyers want to buy a lot because it's cheap, so they're excited. But the sellers, not so excited. They're going to offer a much smaller number of units for sale than the buyers want to buy at that price. Okay. Now, when there were more units for sale than consumers wanted to buy, we called that a surplus. When we have the reverse situation, where there's fewer units available than the buyers want to buy, we call that a shortage. Okay. Uh, now, when you have a shortage, think about what that is going to do. If you were a seller, uh, again, selling orange juice, but now the price that you're selling at is sufficiently low, First of all, you're not getting a lot of inventory coming in from your suppliers. It's difficult to find suppliers who are willing to sell you the product at a price that low. On the other hand, you've got consumers beating down your, your door to get that orange juice, right? So, um, you know, you every time you get a new shipment in for sale, there's maybe a line of consumers waiting there to get it. Uh, and also you've got uh, maybe consumers calling you up, asking when your next shipment is going to come in. You might have some buyers uh, calling you up, asking if they can pay you money now so that they'll be at the front of the line when you do get a, um, a shipment in. Okay. And so what is that going to do? Well, that's going to put upward pressure on the price because as a seller, you're going to realize, hey, there's a profit opportunity here. If I raise the price of the product that I'm selling, I can still sell everything that I'm selling right now. In fact, I can probably sell more because I can afford to, uh, to purchase more product from my, my suppliers. I can raise prices 
and sell more product than I'm selling right now, okay? Because I'm in a, a situation of, uh, of shortage. And so we would say that uh, competing buyers push prices up. It's going to put upward pressure on price. Why? Because the buyers are competing with other buyers. So competition among the buyers basically clues in the sellers that they can afford to raise prices and continue to sell more units. And that's gonna push this price farther up, closer up to, uh, to that intersection of supply and demand. By the way, in the last six months, you have seen this at work, or at least you've read news stories about it, because you may have heard about uh, shortages of consumer products like most famously toilet paper. Okay, now we're going to talk about this more in the lecture on price controls, but what's going on there is that we had a shortage of product, right? Because of COVID-19, people doing some panic buying and also um, some disruptions in the, the supply of toilet paper, there was less toilet paper to go around relative to what people wanted to, uh, to consume, okay, or to buy right up front. So we had this shortage, okay? Uh, that puts upward pressure on the price, but in the case of California and actually most states, because we were in a state of emergency, the stores were not legally allowed to raise their prices on uh, toilet, pe toilet paper, at least not by more than uh, five or 10 percentage points, okay? And so that's why you saw those shortages persist. The prices stayed the same, Buyers were competing with each other. They wanted to uh, to get whatever product was uh, was available, but the shortages persisted because prices could not be pushed up because government policy prevented that from happening. But if there are no price controls, uh, that's not going to be an impediment, and competition among the buyers will tend to push this price back up towards the intersection of supply and demand. All right. So if it is the case. The prices that are above the intersection are unstable. Prices that are below the intersection are unstable. What is true if the price is exactly equal to the intersection of supply and demand? Okay, well, let's take a look. There's our price. And I'll draw a line down there to go for the quantity. This price we're going to call PE, the equilibrium price, and we'll see why it's an equilibrium, or I'll, I'll kind of spell out why it's an equilibrium uh, shortly. Okay, Take that price where it hits the intersection of supply and demand. Notice that the number of units that sellers want to sell is going to be right here where that price hits the supply curve. Okay, So that is QS the quantity supplied. What about how many units consumers are going to want to purchase at that price? Well, this equilibrium price hits the demand curve at the same quantity that it hits the supply curve. So we've got QD for the quantity of, of units demanded. And notice that here at that equilibrium price, those two quantities are equal to each other. This intersection is the only place on the graph where if the market price is at that point, sellers want to sell exactly as many units as buyers want to buy, okay? If the price is above that point, then sellers are gonna to wanna to sell more than buyers want to buy. If the price is below that point, sellers will want to sell fewer units than buyers want to buy. But if the price exactly intersect, or exactly hits that intersection of supply and demand, Sellers want to sell exactly as much as buyers want to buy. And so now the market is stable. There's no excess competition pushing prices up or excess competition pushing prices down. The market is going to reach a resting point, which is what we call an equilibrium. And you can think about this. I mean, it's, it's a similar idea to, um, to like physics. 
imagine that you have like a, a hillside or maybe this is a, a bowl, a smooth bowl. Uh, if you take a marble and you set it on the, on the slope there, this would not be an equilibrium point for, for that ball because you've got gravity pulling downward and you also have the curvature of the ball pushing it, pushing the, the ball in that direction. And so this ball is going to start rolling down the side, right? Now it's probably not going to stop here at the bottom immediately. Maybe it rolls up a ways on the other side. Is that an equilibrium? No, because you've got, again, gravity pulling down and you have the slope of the, the bowl pulling to the right, and so the ball is gonna move down this way. Eventually, the ball is gonna settle in this place, right? And notice that at that point, gravity is pulling down, which is fine, uh, and the curvature of the bowl is not pushing in either direction. So that's the one point that is stable. It's the same basic idea with prices in equilibrium and quantity in equilibrium. That's the only point in um, price and quantity space where there's nothing pushing the price in an opposite direction of, uh, of where it currently is, okay? So let me write down the definition of equilibrium price. The equilibrium price is where buyers want to buy as many units as sellers want to sell. Okay, and so this is why economists would tell you that in a market where there's no central planning, where you just let the prices, uh, you, you, you just let people trade at whatever price they want to, Economists would tell you that market is going to be able to extract all of the available gains from trade because it's going to do a pretty good job of finding the right equilibrium price. And at that price, all of the transactions that you want to happen are going to happen. And none of the transactions that you don't want to happen are going to happen.